Good evening, everybody. It's um, a huge honor for us to welcome Professor Kostas Kotsakis tonight to the British School at Athens. Welcome to everybody in the room. Welcome to everybody online too. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Professor Kostak Kotsakis, sorry. <laughs> I keep thinking of Christos Kostakis. <laughs> um, uh, is of course the uh, Emeritus Professor of the Department of Archaeology and History, Aristotle University uh, of Thessaloniki. He is an influential archaeologist, as uh, you all know, of course, specializing in prehistoric archaeology, but also is a, a, a possibly a forerunner in the field of public archaeology in Greece as well. And for that, we have much to thank him for. He has had and indeed continues to have a prolific career. Um, and I want to share some of the highlights with you. His interdisciplinary approach to excavations, collaborative excavations, and pivotal excavations, such as Sesklo in Volos, Chatal Huyuk in Turkey, and Despilio in West Macedonia, which we'll hear more about, as well as his participation and or coordination in over 30 large-scale collaborative projects funded by the EU, by Greece, and by private foundations. And the latest one, indeed, is this Explo project uh, that we will hear about, a collaboration with Ailey Bogard in Oxford and colleagues also from Switzerland. His innumerable publications have had significant impact on the academic world, and um, his accolades are many very many, visiting scholar, honorary member of, for example, Clare Hall in Cambridge, uh, Stanford University, UCL in London, and University of Cincinnati, to name but a few. But actually, I think the greatest accolade he has is in the form of the people that he's inspired, those people who have been a whole generation of Greek archaeologists who owe their love and passion for Greek archaeology, whether they're still in it or not, to uh, uh, his teaching and over 30 PhD students, a veritable army of PhD students to come to defend him should he ever need it. With that, I can't thank you enough for being here and we're all really looking forward to what you have to say tonight. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much for this uh, generous introduction. Um, and thank you for inviting me to this uh, institution where I am sort of related for a long time now. My talk this evening will be about the Neolithic Dispilio, as you can see here, uh, a task, uh, a site located in the south coast of uh, Lake Astoria, um, which uh, introduced um, Greek archaeology um, to these very unusual type of sites, which are the lake settlements. It's the first lake settlement that actually was um, uh, excavated and uh, researched in, in uh, Greece. Um, I will present also, I will present the re-examination of this uh, site, which started, okay. Um, the re-examination of, the, of this uh, rich evidence that we have from uh, this video um, in view of the preparations for the uh, final uh, publication of the Dispilio excavations. Okay. Well, it was supposed to be a map here, but never mind. Okay. I will uh, start my talk with um, posing um, rather a, a kind of uh, um, a query I have on the material. The earliest Neolithic uh, settlements, as you can see here, and uh, you see here, um, is there a pointer somewhere? Just the mouse on the mouse on the. So if you use the mouse on the. Okay, I have my own. <laughs> there you go. It's even lecture or reading 
So you see here, Sesclo and Pallambe la Colindrosa site have been excavating before getting involved with the Vispillo. So um, there are sites which um, they uh, choose areas which are dry. And um, as you can see, they are in the, uh, in the hills, in the low hills. That's a typical uh, early Neolithic uh, location. And, um, but not near sources of water. Of course, there is water near the sites because as we all understand, you cannot live without water, but it's not really waterlogged sites. So um, by um, eight years, 8,000 years ago, that's around 6,000 or soon after 6,000 BC, um, sites are established in wet environment, um, mainly in the north of Greece. Uh, and this below is one of those that sites. Um, you, you can see this below here. It's one of those sites. Uh, and you see the uh, actual uh, look of the site you know, when Krumuziadis uh, uh, ended his excavations. So these sites preserve also a lot of waterlogged wood, like the, the posts or the piles you see in this last picture at the bottom, um, where they are um, very uh, well preserved, um, survived in the, uh, in the mud of the, uh, in the anoxic environment of the bottom part of the pile. So the top part is uh, decayed, as you can see, but the, the bottom will come later to that again. Right. So, Okay, so this is Neolithic uh, Vispillo as uh, excavated by uh, Muziavis. And these are the two trenches that uh, Teoharis has uh, on. And Muziavis dug. That's the east sector and the west sector. And there are smaller ones um, here and there. And the characteristic of this uh, settlement of Neolithic Vispillo is that it, it it uh, occupies an equator. That's a place where two different ecological, um, let's say, environments, landscapes meet. And this it's by the lake, by the coast of the lake. So the first uh, um, information about this Pileo was in 1938 by Keramopoulos. Keramopoulos was a very uh, well-known uh, Greek archeologist of the before war period. And uh, he came there in 1938 on the quest of uh, Hellenistic fortresses. And um, he noticed uh, that uh, in the area of Dispilio, uh, because of the level of the lake was down at that period, there appeared these um, uh, posts or pines you can see in the photograph of 1938. So he made a connection with the uh, uh, pile dwellings uh, of uh, Central Europe, and also, of course, with uh, the reference by uh, the ancient uh, sources about people who were living in uh, in the lakes in the antiquity. Okay. Now, this uh, close uh, proximity to the lake. Um, uh, first of all, need some explanation, which I'm saying from the start that I will not give you at the end because I don't know yet why they chose this. <laughs> they made this strange uh, decision to live exactly by the lake. They could very well go, let's say, a few uh, meters away, which is totally dry. But sometimes there are floods, like you see in 2010. And these floods... Um, 
may pose, pose some problem. But um, it's not so often that there are floods. And so uh, it's not so, uh, let's say, we'll discuss this later. Maybe it's not a problem that actually forced them to do something, to take some decision. OK. In this talk, we will talk about the history of this Pillot excavations first, then, then dating this Pillot, the Explore project, and the absolute calendar dating of the structures. And I make the distinction between carbon-14 and dendrochronology, and um, about the architecture, untangling the strategic of the site, revealing the hidden houses, and then a few things about material culture, which is are really, it's really, um, very special. Now let's see. The first period of excavations, because uh, Keramopoulos did a very small uh, excavation, not really interested, and he found few things. It's dated in the Neolithic correctly. Uh, but it's not really an excavation. But the first period was by started in 1992 by Hormuz whom you see here in his late years, and uh, lasted uh, until 2013, when uh, he uh, um, when he died. Um, and on this occasion, um, let me um, say that uh, all of us who work in this video. We owe a lot to Yorgos Fumziavis because he had the courage and the persistence to start such a research uh, in the time where we knew very little about this type of sites. And also his uh, pioneering work actually um, inspired all of us to the study of, uh, to put uh, Neolithic societies in the foreground. So I think we owe a lot to the museums. Okay, some of the historical photographs. This is Hulmuziadis with his uh, students in the first year of uh, uh, the excavation in this video. And here is the uh, excavation of Hulmuziadis. We've seen this from the area of, area of photograph before. You see the two sectors, the Eastern sector and the Western sector, which we will uh, talk about later. Oh. How do I go back? Ah, okay, okay. So here you see the the the, the number is of uh, uh, piles that survive in uh, and post holes. They are all together, and you can see how um, dense it is. this is a cloud of uh, points, and probably you can um, realize why it's so difficult to actually decide where are the houses. Of or which are the houses of the uh, of, of this below? Because uh, you can see whatever you like in this dense, uh, let's say, cloud of um, points. Okay, and um, I have the impression that for this reason, because it was so densely and um, it, um, packed with the posts, and it, it was not something you could decipher. The, um, the, 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 the major interpretation was that these were piles supporting terraces, and then on the terraces were the houses, which consequently did not survive. And also there were three, you see here the model on the left, and there were three basic phases in this video according to this uh, scenario, which is the, the, the piles uh, in the platforms of uh, the water. Uh, that was called the lake phase. Then the amphibian phase where some houses, you can see it, for instance, here or there. Some, some houses are over water, some. And then uh, the last phase where it was a uh, land, a dry land phase. And I must say here in uh, as a, in this occasion, I must say that this is more or less um, the same that happens, the same ideas that uh, 
um, are put forward in the study of uh, lake settlements in, in Central Europe, um, in Switzerland, and Germany, and, 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 and yeah, other places. That you can have these three combinations. You can have something which is on the water, uh, others which are on, uh, let's say, water and non-water, and then there are others which are totally on dry land. So this was put in, a, in a, these three cases, these three styles, let's say, of uh, settlement, were put in one in this video. Um, and also, I think this um, open, I call it open, open museum, not a restaurant. I call it an open museum because it's not really a reconstruction of the settlement, but this is the very familiar and it interprets, it realizes the first stage of, uh, um, of this below settlement. Okay. Now let's go to the second period, which starts with the uh, explore project. And um, it aims at uh, the re-examination of, uh, of um, the Spillor, among other things. So the, 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 ger the general, the main, the central aim of the project Explore is to study the relation of human activity and environment in lake settlements in Southeast Europe. And for that, there are these four people who actually join forces. Uh, Albert Hafner is very well known for his... Uh, activity in uh, dealing with uh, lake dwellings. And he was certainly got uh, an award by the Shanghai, uh, uh, whatever it is anyway. Uh, Willy Tiner is paleo, uh, uh, paleo environmentalist and um, he's doing um, the uh, paleo environment reconstruction. Amy Bogart, well known for her work on uh, uh, farming uh, t um, practices and uh, strategies, and archaeobotanist, and then myself with the experience on uh, excavations and the Neolithic, you heard very kindly by the director before. So these are the four, and these are the 40, they are a bit more, I think, the f some I forgot to put, the 40 people who work for the University of Thessaloniki and in the framework of the Explore team. So a lot of people. Okay, the goals. Let's understand the choice of setting, settling in a waterlogged environment. As I said before, this is a question. Define the adaptation of economy to the special uh, lecastrine I think I said it correctly, environment. Um, and then uh, third, assess the changes to the lives and practice of the Dispilio people in community. These are the main goals, very uh, general and difficult to actually do. But more achievable things uh, like the targets are the following. Reconstruct the environment, the landscape, and the climate. This is uh, really Tinner's uh, help uh, job, but we, we have a lot of information from this video as well. Um, examine thoroughly the stratigraphies of the site, define the settlement layout, and re-examine the architecture, and finally finalize the study of the rich collection of artifacts. So place this below in its wider cultural context. That's the most ambitious of all. Okay, now let's uh, start with the piles or posts of uh, this below. Piles uh, refer more to terraces and uh, platforms, but uh, posts are more related to houses as indeed they are. Now, um, when we are talking about the, the piles or posts of this below, we are talking to give you an example of pieces of wood like this one here. So this is uh, two piles which are, uh, are taken out uh, to see. Um, there, there are very big trunks of uh, trees 
uh, more than 40 centimeters, not all of them, not a, more than 40 centimeters in diameter, and they go down at least one meter and a half. Um, what they are taking out here from is uh, the actual bottom of the lake. Okay. Well, the former lake in that area. And you see how it is uh, worked at the edge. Uh, you see this. Uh, okay. These are the, the, the bottom part and the part that it's usually put into the mud. And of course, the tool that uh, studies that actually is responsible for this kind of work. It's very, um, it's very amazing that this wood is so well preserved until now. Okay. Now um, they are not all the tree, all the uh, posts are not the same uh, species. They don't represent the same species. Um, the, the the majority is uh, junipers. Um, which is uh, abundant in the area, still there. And then there is um, a small, smaller number of oaks and some conifers, which are um, later. We found out that juniper is uh, a later addition. The first, the oldest uh, houses, the earlier houses, earliest houses are made of oak. And then they changed to juniper. Juniper is a very hard wood uh, surviving um, very well, in, and that explains its uh, um, the, the fact that it survived. But um, also, um, juniper is very difficult to dendrochronology to make to for dendrochronologists because it tends to make extra rings that are actually confused. But uh, I'll talk about that briefly later. Okay. Now, the first thing we did, I did when I started in 2014 with the um, with this video, the excavation, the, the site, was to re-examine the stratigraphy. We, um, we made um, a photogrammetric uh, uh, plan of the stratigraphy, which uh, was one-to-one uh, -one scale. And then I drew it personally on scale one to 10. And this is just... Uh, computer say assessment um, view of that it's very detailed when I did the stratigraphy uh, I find it very very interesting and very strange that there was no trace of these famous terraces that actually have made um, supposedly the first phase of uh, the lower phase of uh, this plot there were no traces in fact, Coming from um, an excavation, excavations who is done on dry land, not waterlogged area, um, it looked very much like the familiar uh, excavation picture that I had from this uh, site. So I, I, I sort of uh, was a bit perplexed about that, and that's where my uh, questions started to. Uh, grow up. Now, when we have sites, uh, these are these two photographs are from uh, uh, from Switzerland, from uh, Zurich. The excavations in the Opera Park in Zurich. When you have sites which are all part of sites which are really uh, on the water, then what you get in the stratigraphy is something like the photographs here. You have a zone, a belt of uh, anthropogenic material which is usually black. Then you have layers of marl that actually represent the actual bottom. So you have this, let's say, sequence of uh, bottom of the lake, uh, human uh, anthropogenic material, and uh, vice versa. And you see the same here. But when we go to the Spillot uh, stratigraphy, nothing of the sort is there. What you see here is black, black lines, which are all over the excavation, are uh, phases, are periods where the site has developed into a marl, or um, into, sorry, into a bog or a swamp, okay? And uh, nothing, um, it has nothing to do with uh, what we've seen 
let's say in Zurich, for instance. And this is uh, um, a section of the natural deposits under, underlying the archaeological levels uh, from this video. We, go, we went down one meter and a half, as, as we, you can see. Um, it's just a marl, which is actually the bottom of the lake. Uh, is different, um, and um, uh, this black line you can see here is very thin, a few uh, millimeters black line here has not has no organic material. So don't be misled thinking that this is again anthropogenic material, as I feared. Um, it's um, the exposure of a mar. Of uh, and then um, the, the the line is mineral, not organic, so it has nothing to do with what we've seen in Zurich. So this is a very different situation. So let's come to the riddle of the video, which was supposedly will be solved. <laughs> Okay, again, the familiar, um, what are these files there? What do they, um, they, they give the, uh, the impression that this is something that it's uh, more or less um, a mass of um, same period things. They, they stick from the, to the same height or things like that. Uh, but they, they, they are not of the same period. They are of many different periods. And the thing is that they go very deep down and the depth of the, of the piles has nothing to do with the uh, uh, date. So it's not like uh, something like we have in uh, stratigraphy where the lower part is earlier and the upper part is, is later. Here, the, the, uh, what I, I say is these um, uh, posts are like, uh, you know, a lift that actually moves uh, up and down from pile to pile in the stratigraphy. So there's no way to actually date these things in. Uh, of course, you can um, uh, date them by carbon-14, but can you actually decide on uh, um, which piles are of the same period so you can relate them to uh, a house? Uh, the question is no, you cannot, because you see how the Carbon-14, we, we all know the limitations of carbon-14 and within the range of the uh, of any, any measurement of carbon-14, you can have a lot of piles belonging even of different houses. It's too wide to be useful. So there's no way. So where are the houses? That's the riddle. Where are the houses? Well, most of the, all the colleagues who have experience on, on um, sites like that um, agree that the only way to actually define the houses, decide which posts belong together and form a house, is dendrochronology. You have to, to get the dendrochronological uh, measurement. For this, you need to sample everything. So this was a very tough decision for me because I had to decide to actually destroy the site uh, in the sense that while in, in the site you could visit and see the picture you saw before with the pine sticking out, very impressive, or at least to our eyes, I don't know how impressive it is for the audience, then when you cut them, nothing is visible anymore. And also for Musiavis, I know from uh, private discussions, uh, he didn't want to because Musiadis knew the dendrochronology approach. It was not uh, Cunningham that been to this video and take some samples. But he didn't want to go on with that because he wanted the site to stay like that. And his, his idea was let it be for as long as it will last. We don't. He didn't mind. But the thing is that... Um, the, the the problem the problem is very simple. Either you cut or destroy, if you like, the site. You cut, you sample all the piles, 
and learn something. You miss it, you lose the sight, but you will learn something. Or you let it as it is, so you eventually lose the sight, you, you would never learn anything about the sight. So it will be forever a mystery. So um, this was the argument I put forward to the ministry, because the ministry also were, was not very enthusiastic about the idea of cutting all the pines of this video, which were already famous. Any case, anyway, um, I suppose uh, most of you won't uh, know about dendrochronology, but for those who don't, I make a very brief introduction, very brief, very brief explanation of the method. It's very simple, basically. It's uh, it's actually not a very sophisticated thing. You don't need a fancy, um, let's say, laboratory like uh, an accelerator or something like that. You just need um, a microscope and a small measuring scale. Uh, actually, you can use. Um, the first thing is is to to take the samples. As you can see, you you can you take uh, these discs of uh, wood which is in good condition, and um, you see here how this is done. First, on on the field on the left, you see you cut them with a chainsaw, very brutal in a way, and then you cut it with a how do you call that machine, and actually with a with a, a saw, a powerful saw, and um, then you take it to the lab. This was done in. Um, in this pillow. So the lab was transferring this pillow. As I said, it's very simple technology. You don't need anything sophisticated. So um, the basic of dendrochronology is that, you know, of course, that uh, trees add a ring every year. So it's a kind of calendar. And um, the, 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 width, the width of, the, of, the, of these rings depends on the climate of the period. If, if it's wet, they are fat. If it's not wet, if it's dry, they are very thin, close to each other. So the succession of, uh, um, let's say, fat and thin lines, if I may use the term, um, is very characteristic in a particular area. So as you see uh, on the bottom here, you, you can uh, sort of, uh, combine pieces of wood and make a long sequence of rings, okay? Now these rings measure years. So the question that you have is, how do you connect this line of years with something which is fixed in time? And in um, places where they have a lot of uh, lines, they've been doing this for years and they have a lot of wood, they have long lines that can go either to very precisely dated things or to the present, but we don't. So how do we do it? Now, this is where the cosmic thing uh, works. First of all, um, let's say that um, um, our percentage of uh, as you can see here, the percentage of success, well, we cut about nearly 900 holes, um, piles, and the percentage was uh, 22.6. So it was just 178. So it's not strange. This is about normal. This is how much you get. A lot of this uh, wood is sacrificed, the piles are sacrificed in order to have the few that will uh, give dates. This is how it is. We cannot, but luckily um, we overcome, I mean, the people who work, I mean, especially Andrei my, my Skowski, uh, who did the actual measurement of uh, junipers, overcome the problem of junipers in some magical way. Okay. So was there a fixed point in uh, time, 74? 7,500 years back? That's the question. Well, it, there is. And there was a cosmic, a solar superstorm that occurred in, in uh, 5,259 BC, um, which is fixed, dated by um, 
many sources, especially in trees, by carbon-14, and also um, and dendrochronology, and also uh, from the Pagetones, um, um, Pagetones. Anyway, the, the 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 glaciers in in the Antarctic, which also measures <clears throat> the time, and this is why they are so valuable. What happens in uh, in uh, fifty two fifty nine BC is that a huge superstorm happened on the surface of uh, the Earth, as you can see in this uh, very impressive picture from NASA. And then uh, this influences the, the Earth, which is the big blue thing or purple thing that is there. And that's Earth. Influence, uh, first of all, the magnetic field of Earth, and uh, this causes a lot of uh, upset, as we will discuss and say later on. And also affects the trees by uh, increasing the amount of carbon-14 that uh, exists in the atmosphere. So here you have, you see the, uh, this is the normal curve of carbon-14 and you see here the dates and then suddenly they leap up, they make a jump and then start again to become low. This, this is called the Miyaki event. And was it has nothing to do with the fashion designer, I must say. For those who know Miyaki, uh, he's famous. Anyway, this is a, a, a she, she, a physicist, a, a woman physicist in in Japan, uh, who actually uh, observed this and uh, put it in uh, 774. Okay, and then there were more. For instance, this article. It says three rings reveal two strong solar proton events in uh, 771, 76, and 52, 59. That's one. But no one has actually done it for archaeology, for archaeological samples. That's trees up there. Okay. Um, okay. And um, you see here the carbon 14 which is directly comparable to the model on the left from this below. So this was really um, the Miyaki event that actually made this uh, fixed point. So all the dates uh, from both directions uh, before and after 5,259 were actually dated to the year all the wood was dated to the year. So that was a big success. And now this is going to appear in nature as a, as a paper because it's obviously something which has wider mm. significance. Uh, these um, events happen in every even now, for instance. This is something that happened in uh, November 6 uh, in 2023, just a few months ago in Northern Greece. And you see how the the, the 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 sky was was painted red at night. It's an aurora borealis, but in the south, and it's not green. It's uh, it's red. It has something to do with. The, I don't know. There's an, a physical explanation for that, but I don't know what. Anyway, but this was a very insignificant event, and the big event of uh, five two five nine. Um, would be uh, really very obvious in the skies of the Neolithic uh, Spiro. And um, something, um, a big one that happens in Pittsburgh in 1859, um, which was not as big according to the specialists like the 5259, actually uh, collapsed all the uh, communications whatever it was at that time, you know, telegraphs, electricity. Now, um, I suppose if something like that happens now, all the computers will be destroyed. The solar, the, the, cell, the cell phones start, will start to work. So it will be something interesting. Okay, 
Now, with this um, date, starting with this uh, date, we, we could uh, actually produce precise dates, um, which you see here for the site, that uh, are coupled to the carbon-14. They, they, they are more or less um, go together with the carbon-14 that is taken from this below. Either the old ones or the new ones that we actually did. At the moment, uh, this video has, I suppose, around 200 um, carbon-14 dates. And uh, you can see the, uh, the different, uh, there are 17 building events, uh, uh, excuse me, 15 building events. And then uh, the phases, according to the stratigraphy, they are uh, now seven rather than three. As before, what I want you to notice is that uh, excuse me, uh, is that uh, there are two gaps here, here and there. So this gap gap is um, again is uh, is one of those uh, uh, bogs that develop in in um, we are trying to understand now how it is. This is a geo micro micromorphological thing, and then the other one is another one, another. Uh, smaller gap, it's about 65 years, um, which again is a second ball. So there are two episodes of box, box falling. Okay. Okay. Now let's let's go to the high. Let's turn to the houses. What am I doing about time? How? How? It's a uh, six, six, six. Ten minutes. Ten, ten minutes. What's wrong? It's that kind of thing. Ah, okay. Okay. Thank you. Right. I have to rush a bit. Okay. Um, let's uh, go to the houses. No, the the deeper the deeper level of the of uh, of the excavation and the first houses we call it phase zero because we found it after we have identified phase one is um, here you see um, a, a, the edge of a house and uh, and. Uh, and also a trench, the, the trial trench 482 that was uh, excavated here to actually investigate and uh, check the stratigraphy again. Um, so you see the, um, the house and uh, here you see something which is very interesting. First of all, uh, let's move to the second. You see the, the, the earliest house, which is, um, this is the foundation of the, of the floor. Um, which is sits on this natural sediment. The, the locals call it pilina, pilina from pilos, and it's uh, a clay, a yellowish clay loam, basically, um, which has um, micromorphologically has evidence of trampling. So it was a dry, open area. People were walking on it. It was no lake, no water. And you see the, um, the the constructions here, which meant to prevent the rising uh, humidity from the the, the basis of uh, from the bottom from the and um, the, what they do is they they make these uh, wooden constructions you can see here and this have been and then they've been removed. And then um, you they put sand or sand and woods and branches, and they make a kind of layer that actually inhibits the moisture from coming through that and make the living area damp. So this is the, the very first houses, and uh, we have dates for that. They are 5,800 or thereabouts, not dendro. Uh, we don't have dendro chronology for this early. Phase. Okay, and this is the other half of the house, which we see before with as a line of course, that actually, or uh, the other part of the house, and uh, you can see, perhaps you can uh, see from where you are sitting, uh, some lines which are uh, a wooden floor, 
these are the planks of the floor. So this is basically the first oak floor in Europe because it's a, it's a, it's an oak floor in planks. We have to say that. Now these are the dates of the of the of this area, of the carbon fourteen dates, and you can see here in the break of the of the dates the the, the gap that we observed dendrochronologically. So this is verified by two methods. Another early house is this. Um, you see here at the at the back of the uh, of the of this this is possibly a wall. And you see here the early um, bob here and the later bob up here. So there are two phases of bob. And then again, it's a habitation. And these are the some an example of the columns that the micromorphologist takes from the stratigraphy. Uh, she took so many, we don't have place to store them now. This go to France to be impregnated with uh, some sort of. Uh, resin, then cut in slices uh, for ex and polished for examination in the microscope and see details. And then if need be, some of them would be cut down to 30 microns and become a thin section. They are big, they are, they are like that. They're not these little things, they're massive mammoth uh, slides. That's what they call it. Okay. Let's start with the houses. So uh, house zero is the one we already seen. And then house one, house two, we don't have posts, we don't have dendrochronological information for that. But as you can see, um, the, 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 the construction, the debris here indicates that there was some construction, maybe not built with posts, but uh, certainly with wood, as we see with all these things that uh, survive there, okay? And you see the preparation of the floor, the under, uh, underground floor of these houses. These photographs actually show you. It's very familiar. It's the same as the one we've seen in, Z, in the floor zero, in house zero. You see branches and wood with the uh, sand and um, in, in different layers, and then on top. And this is a distribution of the um, pottery that actually, um, um, it's, it's possibly um, shows these three, I think it shows the three houses, these three concentrations, one in the south, the zero, uh, the one on top, and the two in the middle. Um, and this, the, let's go at the, at the, at the um, results of the dendrochronology. Uh, this um, area here, you see this uh, little blue. There are these dates. So there are posts who belong to these dates. And perhaps we can see here a line, and maybe here one crossing that way. Um, and then um, this is uh, the date uh, 5,322 to 5,293. So you have this. And then this bit. Later, uh, 5,053, uh, 56 to 5320. And now if you put all this together, you get the um, kind of uh, the, the, the plan of the house, not complete, of course, um, dated from uh, 5349 to 5320. Um, um, so this was... It's not, it's not complete, but it was there. So the, this house was uh, uh, there for at least 30 years. Now in uh, 50, 5294, you get this uh, complex uh, of uh, uh, piles, of posts, which is a very, it probably is the, the better preserved house. Um, which again has a lot of uh, reconstructions. So in 5262, you get uh, another here, you get another pile. Then in uh, 5261, you get a few more. 
then 59, you get these two. One of those is the one I show you who, who was taken out. Then uh, 52, 58, few more. Then 52, 57, a bit more. So you get a lot of uh, maintenance of this house, reconstructions. They were very persistent with this house. Um, the last um, repair, um, um, until the last repair, to this uh, building lasted for 37 years. And if you consider that this is um, built, as you can see here with the red dots, on top of an older building, uh, that uh, the whole thing lasted for almost 100 years. So that's very unusual. First of all, because we don't have uh, building house upon house in this type of settlements. This is very typical in uh, tell settlements. So um, that's interesting, very interesting. Uh, what is also very interesting is the... Okay, how the house is... Um, well, we've seen this before. Um, and first of all, there are some traces of wooden floor. Although it's not on the wet area anymore. It's much higher. Then um, here, there is um, an area of, um, of uh, food preparation. And you see, this is an open space, I think, or maybe um, an open and roofed. But... Then I forgot to tell you that this house is surrounded by uh, a fence. So all these indicate that this is something very special, probably. And uh, special are the uh, equipment, is the equipment of the house. First of all, you get these flutes near outside the house, both sides, north and south, in the yards, let's say, of the house, um, which are, there are four flutes in this video. One of them is um, made of a human bone. So you can imagine what the human bone will make to these people partaking. And this is uh, something very strange. It's, it's, uh, it's, uh, like, it's very big. It's like that. Okay. It's um, the bust of, uh, of, a, of a goat. And maybe it, it was found next to the, to the hearth. So maybe something related to the hearth. Don't tell me that I imagined this because I was in Chatalhuyu, but it looks like like that. Chatalhuyu is much heavier. And also, this huge, big, 45 centimeters of uh, human figure of, uh, of a sitting woman. Uh, very, uh, very impressive with uh, bracelets in uh, the, the, the hands. Um, interesting also is the um, information we get, not only from the equipment of the house, but from the construction, the architecture of the house, the construction um, details. These are uh, dog with impressions, which are very, um, uh, Dimitris Kinas studies this, and he's here, so he can, okay. So um, they indicate that uh, the walls, first of all, the, the posts were big posts that actually were holding the roof. Then uh, the walls were made with uh, the water and dome technique. And then on top, you would get um, uh, this um, plaster, which was actually put by hand so and fingers. So it was quite elaborate. And uh, Dimitris, who has studied this material, tells me that there are differences from house houses to houses, and the house four has a, a particular uh, special treatment. Is that right, or am I exaggerating? Yeah. Okay, let's move on. Uh, this is a, another two two more houses, five, five, house five and house six. Um, you see the, the photograph with the hearth. Okay. The characteristic of this house, and this is why I show to you, is that it's full of pithoi. 
it's it's a storage it's a it's a granary let's say and also outside this complex of two houses house four to the right and house um five six to the left um there were very interesting things found for instance here uh, in the next to the hearth it was uh, found the, the women statuette is not really a figure in it anymore was found and then to the right the goat head and then here the flutes and here more flutes and there a figurine that i am going to talk a bit more in a, in a little uh, if house five was a granary and he was uh, next to the uh, um, the oven outside really outside uh, next to the uh, house five um, he could be um, um, something like a guardian of the and he's an old man we'll talk about it it's quite interesting and unique and house seven and then house eight which is the biggest of all which is quite later house 10 and nine two more houses these are not reconstructed by dendrochronology because there are no piles we are very high now and then in west sector which we have have a totally different uh, um, let's say architecture and technique they are all with mud very few pile uh, posts no piles of course but i won't deal with that and finally uh, fi uh, phase uh, seven which is uh, as i said open open area now about the um, terraces over water um well it's something which could happen it's it's uh, even in this video you see here a picture from fermi gulf um but um, um, we don't have the evidence. There's no evidence for terraces. And the houses you see are strictly from the beginning on on dry, well, dry, well, anyway, but not bad on the water, on land, okay, on firm land. One thing. The second is that it's not excluded that um, in some parts of the settlement, uh, another part of the settlement could actually move towards the lake and build something like that. Um, if nothing else, uh, the lake has uh, several hundred of pines, which we haven't managed to examine because the um, the area is intractable because of the reed um, vegetation at the edge of the lake. It's impossible to get in, impossible to see anything. But it's possible. I mean, we cannot exclude it, but not the ones excavated. Okay, I'm clear about that because the, the, the literature, the idea that uh, this video was uh, built on terraces is, is uh, repeated again and again. One repeats the other, and we have to be very clear about that. So there were no terraces, at least what we excavated. Okay. And of course, Lake Carla and Mesopotamia. It's very, very widespread all over the world, you know, this solution of living on the water. Okay, first conclusions for architecture. Houses in this pillow were founded with wooden posts directly on the ground from the first earliest phase of the settlement. In total, 13 buildings were identified. This number represents a minimum. Many, uh, more houses might be uh, uh, identified. Houses at this pillow were widely spaced with an average of one or two houses in an area of 500 square meters. No platforms or platforms on which the buildings would stand were confirmed. Living above water on platforms is not excluded in another part of the settlement, as I said before. Okay. At least one house, house four, is accompanied by open spaces where there are storage jars and work such as grinding is done was done. The house is defined by a pile enclosure. House four has been built on the ground plan of an older one. This persistence over all, almost 100 years is unusual for settlements of this type and has not been found elsewhere in the settlement. So this is the general picture of architecture. So now, the importance of the new dating. 
This pillion now is the best dated Neolithic site of the 6th and 5th millennium BC in the Balkans. The new accurate dating and the location of the elusive until now houses makes this pillion a reference site, promotes our understanding and opens several research possibilities. To define the associated material, culture and place it chronologically. To construct the detailed biographies of all houses. To link the biographies with the natural environment and the farming practices to create an inclusive picture of the Neolithic community by bringing in the natural environment and farming practices reconstructed by the interdisciplinary research of Explore. Few things about material culture, if I have the time. Do I have the time? Or do you have the patience for? Okay. Okay, of course we will start from pottery, being a pottery person myself. You see here the people who have worked in pottery, and I will focus on uh, the work done by Marina Sopronidou and Evangelia Bulgari because, because these um, two people have been working for more than 20 years with the pottery of this pignon. And they had a heroic, I will call it heroic, attempt to actually find all the joining parts of uh, um, ceramic and built um, 1,740 pots. The, they could have been many more, but I said enough, stop, because we have to publish, stop. So um, yeah, they, they, they did, but what is really extraordinary is that they document every piece of pottery, its location, and so on a, on a pot which is complete and has all the different pieces, you know every piece of the pot from where it came, which is really astonishing. And it's very helpful because you can actually, on the idea that uh, the sheds, when they break a pot and they spread, they would basically spread on a, on a level surface because they don't climb up. And um, uh, um, so they will be within this, um, this uh, particular uh, level or stratum. So you can check the stratigraphy. And if, uh, uh, something doesn't fit, which it happened many times, we have to revise our uh, accession of the, let's say, for, all this, for the phasing of the site. So in this uh, very complex um, thing, uh, table, uh, the, the, um, the, the columns, which are different colors, are the different trenches, and the arrows are the uh, joints, which have actually been uh, seen, for instance, from here you go to there, or from there you go up to here. So the up is relative. So you have all the all the network of joints between uh, the sheds, um, and we are talking about thousands of sheds. So this is really a heroic work, but very useful, and um, I recommend it to excavators if they can uh, spare twenty years to actually do it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this gives us the possibility to actually reconstruct this work that has been done, reconstruct the contents in terms of pottery of every single house. So for instance, you see building four, house four, uh, which is it has a special. You see the pottery that was in this house. You see all these are fragments which have been shared, which have been... And, um, Perhaps I, I pass it quickly, but if you you notice that, that there are no cooking vessels, so uh, their own uh, vessels for consumption, and this is building five, which I told you before that it's uh, it's a kind of granary, and these are some of the of the pithoi that were in this uh, building, and then here are these what's the name? These pans. Pants, we call them pants. We don't know this. They are obviously for some form of cooking, which we we don't quite know very well. So cooking is uh, and some consuming is prevalent. So to give us an idea of what the function of the houses was. Again, house five and six, house six. Okay. I'm, Building 11, you see the pottery from building 11. Oh, 
it's a later, much later house. It's, it belongs to the late Neolithic too. So it's fifth uh, millennium uh, rather than sixth millennium. And you see the change of pottery is quite, quite remarkable. You see different, uh, but I'm not going to deal with the uh, typology of pottery because it's, uh, I, know, I know it's very boring, <laughs> tiring in a way. Okay, the tools. There's a big group of people doing all sorts of tools, um, macrolithic, as Tassos calls them, um, flake tools or chipstone tools, uh, bone tools, and etc. So we have all the. Let's start with uh, since Tassos is here. Let's start with the. Uh, um, uh, we call them. Um, Polish tools, but now we have to call them microlithic, uh, macrolithic, or micro, macrolithic. No, um, this video has has um, a huge number of uh, tools made of this uh, local material, which is serpentinite, and it's uh, in a mountain which is just few. Uh, I don't know, one kilometer, one and a half kilometer, very near the settlement. And um, they, they are very proficient in this way. And they have, according to um, the, the, the people who studied, um, very um, particular, very specific meth methodology for making the tools. You see here, big and uh, small. And also, since it's a waterlogged site, we have also handles for uh, tools. And you can see how the handle actually worked. Uh, with the tool for um, wooden hands. Also chipstone. We have obsidian from Milos and the Carpathians, um, which is uh, it's, it's getting typical for the sites in the north. Um, Mandal also had the same. And an amazing variety of uh, uh, ornaments and uh, from bone and from and and, uh, and uh, antler. So you, you see a collection, rather artistic. Uh, but I wanted to um, make a, a note for this, which is um, I, I don't know if you are familiar with ocarina, the the kind of uh, whistle, if. Um, they use, they still use in um, uh, Sicily. I don't know if you know that. This is a Neolithic ocarina. It has exact the exact same uh, shape. It's amazing. The the same uh, openings. Of course, you see all the all four flutes. the The human bone is the one second from the bottom, and then. Um, here you see um, a lance or a spear. Uh, and with uh, still the wood attached to it with some resin. And here's uh, bone tools, uh, owls, uh, needles. I think this one is for uh, uh, cleaning, um, or how to say, when you take out the scale, descaling fish. That's my idea. I don't know. Now let's go to the figurines quickly. This is the, the, the most fantastic, I think, figurine and most rare. I, I haven't seen anything similar to that. There's one in uh, North Macedonia in, um, I don't remember now the site, uh, which is, has a similar theme. It's an old man, obviously. You can see his uh, wrinkled face here. You can see his house, his uh, mouth, which is receding, no teeth. And also you can see his uh, very funny position which um, initially people thought that it's a kind of uh, Venus, you know, that actually uh, hides the putenda. But in fact, it's an old man who tries to lift up and support his back, I think. You see his uh, back at the, that's his spine at the back, which is pronounced. This is very typical of uh, a sort of figurines you find in this theme, old age, or sometimes old age and death. There's in this video, in, uh, excuse me, in Chatakuyuk, there's a small figurine that actually has a face in front, but at the back has a skeleton with a, with a uh, spine um, visible. Okay, 
the 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 funny thing about this thing this uh, is that it's a marionette you see it doesn't have legs it has these two holes and uh, it's not that he lost his legs but his legs were added made possibly by wood and uh, this string these um, holes there you can see actually allow a string to pass from the back you see this hole here from the back if you go there, it goes out from the head. So you can move the legs. You can actually, it's a marionette, you can move the legs. So this is a special figurine. It's not something you find, I mean, the typical figurines of the Neolithic. This is something that was, I, I would think, was taking part in some ritual, some sort. Like the wooden dolls. But the uh, figurines are, are, are fantastic, they are exquisite in uh, this video. I'll show you here um, this. Um, they were found ne one next to the other. There are two um, animals, probably cows, with um, bearing a um, um, pot each. Um, the pots are true to type. They are, they are not really fantastic pots, they are real pots. So this is one of the early um, indications that um, they were using animals as uh, verdant animals. And this is a, a very beautiful uh, figurine, really, um, well, it reminds me of, uh, I would say that, it reminds me of classical, uh, no, archaic, archaic, kuri, uh, especially this part. You can go to the Museum of Acropolis and uh, compare. Um, it's it's amazing. I mean, I haven't seen something like that. Usually they are uh, schematic. Uh, of course, this is uh, this probably is final Neolithic because you see it doesn't have a head. It's an uh, the, the the head would be uh, inserted in these stones. And uh, then um, uh, here. Uh, you have the seed of the woman with the bracelets in the hands, which we already see. Now let's go to plants and animals uh, quickly. Um, there's a big uh, team of uh, for for this um, plant and animals uh, section uh, because so much is relied on this. I mean, uh, if we if we are interested in uh, deciphering. Um, the, the ways that people were adapting to this particular environment, um, this will be the solution. Now, for archaeobotany, um, we are looking not only of, uh, the specialists are looking not only on uh, carbonized plants, but also on plants which are, survive intact uh, because the environment is waterlogged. So you have plants, and we try to. We, we hope we'll be able to reconstruct the environment with the evidence we get from the plants, uh, plants which actually live in particular um, wild plants which live in particular environment, and uh, so uh, this this is done by Amy Bogert, and also reconstruct. But as as it goes for the technique for the uh, let's say the practices of so agricultural practices. Uh, it's too early to say. They have the feeling, the specialists have the feeling that it won't be very different, maybe not at all different from what we know from uh, Neolithic sites in land. Uh, but we'll see, it's too early yet. Okay. Uh, zoo archaeology is more or less, um, uh, you see the team here, uh, Rena Veropulidu, uh, apart from Valasia. Uh, Paul Halston, these are really sine uh, qua non. Dominiki Cadi is a, a recent addition. And then we have uh, Rena Veropoulidou for shells and uh, Tatiana Theodoropoulou for uh, fish and uh, Katerina Pagliani, who is here, right, in, for microfauna. Um, and also, since Paul Halston is around, we have ethnographic interviews, this famous Café no Archeologia. Okay, what is interesting in this um, video in terms of animals is first that um, um, it's no different from, um, I would thought that uh, in this environment they would exploit the possibilities. For instance, uh, 
um, cows and uh, bovines in general uh, like this kind of environment. They like to walk in the mud and uh, graze. And uh, in fact, uh, the, the the village had a lot of cows in the past, not anymore, um, and pigs. But cows are very few. And uh, the basic, uh, according to the first in information we get, the basic uh, technique, uh, the basic uh, regime is based on uh, sheep and goats, like everywhere. So they don't exploit the ecotone in any sense. But there are a lot of wild animals, a lot of wild animals, um, deer of all species, uh, bears, oryxes, wolves, fox, etc. So it seems that they were very actively uh, connected with the wild environment. And fish, of course, which we are waiting to see exactly. Okay. No, I sum up now. Um, this video, a very, let's say, summing up about the position of this video in the wider area. This video, it's among the oldest sites of this type in the region. And when I say region, I need Northern Greece, Albania, and maybe North Macedonia. That's where the lakes are. It occupies a strategic position from Thessaly to the Balkan hinterland. It has developed a unique rich material culture with raw materials that came from a distance, such as Mediterranean spondylus shells, obsidian from Milos and Carpathians, marble from the Cyclades, and asphalt possibly from Albania. So it has a bit of everything. It had developed an active industry for the production of polystone axes made from local serpentinite and exchanged with neighboring communities. Avier, for instance, is, is, a, is an importer of uh, tools from Despillon. Uh, uh, the privileged access to the source of serpentinite possibly indicates some form of territorial control because no one else, it's there, it's a mountain, but no one else actually exploits that, at least to the moment. The presence of one house, which differs in its setup and biography and contains unique ritual equipment, can point to activities with social content. Although it is too early to, to, to be precise, there are a few indications so far that the strategies and practices of farming were significantly affected by the special ecoton they chose to occupy. If this rational economic explanation proves inadequate, I mean, an economic one. Cultural choice may be an alternative answer to the question posed at the beginning of this talk, which for the time being must remain unanswered. So, Nolomans and on behalf of the whole team, many thanks for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much for that uh, stunning presentation, such an in-depth examination of a site that um, I'm sure we all feel like, uh, other than those who already work on the site, but we all feel like we know much more, not just about the site itself, but about the Neolithic and the, mm. the lake dwellings too. It's been brilliant. Um, and I was very happily reminiscing about my time in Irish archaeology, where I spent many years in bogs, wet mud, Sticking to my boots, <laughs> and I was feeling very comfortable. Post holes, no other structures, and then you showed these amazing statuettes and figurines and baskets and other <laughs> <laughs> sheets. Okay. Uh, we have a small amount of time for questions, so I'm sure our speaker needs to uh, have a drink and uh, worry about it. So, questions in the audience. I'm going to go. Hmm? Um, well, the lake, we, we don't, you mean in terms of the level of the lake, the water? No, we don't have information. I, we don't have information. But um, uh, the, the thing is that the, the, the site was never underwater. That's, so how far it was, that needs a different uh, oriented 
specifically oriented analysis or examination or research, which we could not afford. So it would remain. But it didn't interfere a lot with the settlement. Let's leave it there. Um, well, the, 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 the the level of the lake now is, uh, of course, is stable uh, because there are gates that open. And uh, but in the past, um, probably there were up and downs, so like in '38, where it was so low. Um, so I think they were coping. There may be um, there may be one house which I didn't have the time to talk in detail. Uh, house eight, which um, has. Um, um it doesn't have anything inside it's it's it doesn't have any any sort of um constructions inside like the others and uh, this may be no floor indication this may be something like standing up on uh, a small height not really on the platform over water but just raised so uh, i'm sure you are familiar with this solution so if there is flood the water passes under it that's why i said at the beginning that floods were not really a serious problem it should not be a serious problem because the the site lived from 5800 down to the end of uh, even to the, in the fourth millennium and there is the bronze age as well phase which i haven't been dealing with so it was a very successful. They may have left it for time, as I said, two gaps, but they are from the um, earlier periods. Then it had uh, become higher and higher with time, and so even if there were floods, they had no problems. All right. Yes, uh, we have a first one is. Is there an apartment in the house that tend to be rebuilt over time? And do they have a specific safe or art located in a specific area? Or in terms of their material, how to present uh, kinds of surrounding figures, etc.? Um, the houses in general, so far as we can tell from the houses we managed to actually identify, um, were not built on the same site so you don't have a kind of uh, continuation or persistence in uh, location or facilities etc that's one thing the other thing is that uh, for some reason the the information we have that has to do also with the archaeology of the, the excavation part the information we have for the for the inside of the houses is not very detailed um, the thing is that um, during the excavation, of course, it was not possible, I mean, to be fair. The houses were not identified in the excavation. So to get information of the inside of the house, you need first to actually identify the house. So we don't have, but even now that we go back on the records, um, we don't find many. Uh, the, the more, more installations are outside the house, the houses, rather than inside. But there's no continuity. The only case you have continuity is house four. It's dug directly, it's built directly on top of an earlier house. And uh, that's very strange, I think. So, uh... If, if uh, I may pose a rather predictable question, is there any news on the Dispilio tablet? Uh, uh, <laughs> I thought I might avoid that. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'll tell you what, because I, I, I've been saying this in many occasions. The Dispilio, first of all, the, 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 the term tablet is misleading because tablets usually have inscriptions in them. Okay. So this has uh, this is a piece of wood. So it's a piece of the dispilio wood, or the dispilio sanida would say okay. in plank would say in uh, the, the plank. Okay, it has some uh, scratches on top. We don't know what they are. Uh, I have to tell you also that this uh, because people don't know that this um, object was not found in excavation in 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 the stratigraphy. It was uh, fished from the bottom of the lake. 
okay? The good is, and I won't say many more things, but I think you can understand. The good can be dated and it's dated, it's 6,200 something. But the scratches cannot be dated, okay? Other questions from the in person audience? You've convinced everybody thoroughly. The actual site, so far as we can tell, is the um, the, the, the very this mound that has been formed and it has been surrounded in the late Bronze Age, Iron Age, with a perimeter wall that precedes. <clears throat> from stone from stone masonry. <clears throat> um, also, we have uh, on on the uh, on the side we have um, supposedly Hellenistic uh, megalithic uh, fortress that's Vanitopoulos dating, but um, we haven't found a single uh, Hellenistic shed. That's very strange because Hellenistic is very abundant. So I doubt that this is Hellenistic. It may be Bronze Age. Who knows? By the way, the Mycenaean pottery of this pillar, which was found in relation to the perimeter wall and the, this building, is fantastic in quality. I've never seen in Central Macedonia something similar. It's fantastic. It's very good quality. There should be um, imports in the Bronze Age, in the late Bronze Age. I think they are dated in three A or something like that, according to Stelios, if I if I remember correctly, Stelios Andreu. Um, so it's something strange there because um, um, I, we don't know what is on. Seasonality studies. Research results from the uh, seasonal study, perhaps about animals or plants. Or... Yeah. Well, it's it's too early to say these uh, things because these these are very much uh, depending on the work of the paleoenvironmentalists, which is in the process. So we we it's too early to say, but it generally. Um, we are a group that uh, doesn't doesn't believe very much in uh, Neolithic people coming and go and living in the society. And, uh, we think that uh, the Neolithic people, like farmers, are tied to the land. They are not. They, they are not just. But part of the settlement may move around. May may like with the shepherds, with the flocks, may go up the mountains and down or whatever. Um, but um, not the whole village. The only case was uh, when uh, the, the settlement in the early phases uh, was turned into a bog. Maybe they moved somewhere. Um, there are a lot of uh, possible um, spots that might uh, have uh, around the lake that have not been, not investigated, not even looked, uh, researched somehow, which might have uh, <clears throat> also. Settlements like that. <clears throat> of the lake? Um, this has to be done by um, some, uh, I mean, some analysis, uh, environmental analysis, because the, the present uh, uh, documents which are kept, they're not reliable. Well, they are reliable, but they they uh, they have this uh, system of draining. They, when, when the water goes up, they open the gates and it goes to Aliakman and then to Salmiki drinks the water. Um, but um, uh, for, for antiquity and for the Neolithic, when I when I pose this to, to colleagues, they say, well, that's a very different problem. And it's not they, they are interested in the climate. They are paleoclimatologists, whatever it's called. <clears throat>